Hi, my name is Ray Kanopka, and in this session, I'm going to be talking about advanced RTTI and Object Pascal. So, first of all, we have to understand what exactly is RTTI. And in Object Pascal, there's actually two variations of that. Uh, there's the classic RTTI, which stands for Runtime Type Information. Uh, it goes way back to the beginnings of Delphi. Um, we also have, in recent versions, extended RTTI. And that's really what my focus is on uh, this session, is the extended, the new RTTI capabilities in the Object Pascal language. Uh, once we go through the kind of the introductory pieces, we're going to take a closer look at the key players that are used in the extended RTTI. Uh, there's several that are involved. Uh, we use those frequently. Um, they give us a lot of power, a very elegant way of, of getting, extracting more information about the various types uh, and their instances that we use. Uh, we'll then explore more of the extended RTTI in a variety of different uh, applications that show uh, several different ways in which we can use uh, this uh, runtime type information uh, in our everyday applications. Uh, and then we'll also wrap it up with a little bit of discussion on uh, method invocation using RTTI, which uh, adds a whole new dimension of uh, flexibility in our code. So first off, as uh, I described just a second ago, uh, runtime type information is what RTTI stands for. It's often called reflection as well. Uh, it's a technique by which we can extract information about a various uh, type that we're, is being used in our code at runtime. And uh, there's a number of different reasons why this is, is useful. Uh, it allows. Um, the compiler to deal with uh, different types of objects in a very unified manner uh, beyond just the uh, single inheritance hierarchy that exists in the object Pascal language. Uh, so, and it's a little bit more fluid than uh, just defining a generic interface that's used throughout uh, a hierarchy as well. So we can. Uh, do some inspecting of a given object. We can determine if it has certain uh, uh, properties or methods and events and, and act on those. And if you think about it, uh, all of these were needed for the IDE itself. Uh, the object inspector that we use every day in all of our applications uh, is really highly dependent on runtime type information. So you select that button that's on your form and the object inspector has inspected all of the various properties that are available and figures out what type they are, how they can be edited, and so forth. And all of that comes from uh, the ability to, to do runtime type information. Uh, it also allows the persistence level to work correctly inside of uh, Object Pascal uh, and the frameworks that we have. And uh, in addition, another common approach for RTTI is in the use of marshalling. Uh, we're transferring data from one process to another out of band, you know, different systems and so forth. RTTI is a very common way to uh, convert the data appropriately to move it to a different destination and then unpackage it back up and be able to manipulate it. So uh, if you've used uh, Object Pascal for, for a while, uh, even if you've gone all the way back to version 1, uh, classic RTTI has been around. Um, and it was available for published properties. And uh, certain classes would define the dollar sign $m plus directive uh, at their declaration. And that would add in the classic runtime type information uh, information you know when you the compiler uh, ran into that type uh, T persistent was one of the classic ones so anything that descended from that class would also get classic runtime type information uh, associated with it uh, all of that uh, the, the nitty-gritty details of how that worked uh, is all located in the tip info unit uh, which is part of the system uh, unit scope um, again, the key piece is that it's only available for published properties. Um, it's also extremely pointer-based. 
Uh, it's a low level uh, groupings of data. You can get a lot of information out uh, of it using classic RTTI, uh, but it's, it is very challenging to kind of orchestrate everything and get everything uh, working appropriately. Uh, fortunately, there are a number of helper functions uh, to read and write values based on what given type you're working with. Uh, so if you're working with some sort of integer property, then you'll use the ordinal values, the set ord prop, get ord prop to extract and set those values uh, and so forth. Uh, and, um, over time, there were a number of other helper functions like the is published prop uh, function was added so that you could very quickly call a simple function, give it the name of a, of a property and an associated object reference, and the runtime type information would be queried and would determine whether or not this particular instant that you passed it actually has this property named published. Uh, if it did, then you can do some more work with it. So it did got the job done, but it uh, uh, it was a bit of a challenge to work with. Well, extended RTTI uh, gives us some of the same kind of information, but way much more. And even better, it's an object-oriented access to that information. And so it's it's very uh, iterative. Uh, we're dealing with different uh, little classes or helpers that allow us to get to this information. And it's all encapsulated into the system.rtti unit. Uh, it, also uses the tip info unit so it's still getting at some of the core data it's just providing another way of managing all of this and being able to extract it all uh, one of the cool uh, changes that was added was that you now have the ability to not just get the published uh, property data uh, type information from those published pieces but you can get it for all of the visibilities so if you if it was so set up you could actually extract out information about the private pieces of a given class very interesting uh, you have to do some extra steps if you want that to work it doesn't get it's not turned on by default but it is there uh, you do have a, access to a lot more information than you did with the original classic RTTI. So we have access to details about index properties, uh, attributes, uh, which kind of go hand in hand with that. Uh, I actually don't go through a lot of details of constructing the attributes, but uh, one of the tenets behind that is that you attribute your code well, you need some way to determine that. Well, that's where the advanced RTTI comes in, is that we can use that to extract what details we have uh, about those attributes. Um, in addition, in classic RTTI, you pretty much had RTTI, or you did not for a given class. But with the extended version, you have a lot more control over what's emitted. And this complicated looking screen, uh, shows how this is done and I'm not going to go through a lot of different examples here more or less just want to emphasize that it is available should you need to control this um, there's an RTTI directive that controls whether or not your new your class will inherit or uh, explicitly remove out other um, scoping identifiers and so the default RTTI setting from system.pass, which is the thing I'm most interested in seeing right now is this section right here. This tells us that the, any class will generate RTTI information for public and published methods uh, for all fields, so private through published. Uh, it will generate for public and published properties. And uh, if you ever wanted to remove all RTTI from a given uh, class, then you could use the explicit and just have empty sets for each of those. But rarely is that ever done. But this tells us what the defaults are, which is why I wanted to include it. So the key players for getting at the extended RTTI are these four. RTTI context, RTTI object, RTTI type, and T value. So let's take them one at a time. So the TRTTI context, it, it, that manages all of the objects that are associated with a given RTTI session. 
And a session, you, we never really see one of those. It's really just in the scope of how we're using the context as we will call various methods, additional RTTI objects and structures are created for us. They are all managed by the context. And so the context, we just need to often have a reference to it and then we can make calls to it. Uh, what's interesting is that the context is actually not a class. It is a record. Uh, so it's a value type and uh, we have we don't have to construct it although you will see some documentation that talks about calling create on it you can do that but you don't have to it's actually not necessary so um, for example if we need to access all the types in our program we can define a context uh, because it's a record type, we can start to use it. It has a method called get types, and we can iterate through that the results of that get types method, which will be references to a t t r t t i type. So then, for t in get types, we can do something. So that's really how it all gets started, and then we'll do variations of that as we move forward. Uh, next, uh, some additional methods. Because um, this will you, you'll always start with. You start with a context reference, then you're going to call methods to actually dig into your program. Uh, remember, the RTTI is generated for your program, so it's not that you're getting all of the type information for the entire, you know, FireMonkey framework or the VCL or whatever is being used. It's whatever your application is is using. So you can get types. You can get a specific type based on a type reference type info pointer that's a reference to classic RTTI uh, but you can also pass the, the uh, a T class reference so any T class will do uh, you can find a type based on a name you can get all kinds of stuff so let's take a look at uh, putting some of this together and what an application looks like so here I have a simple application uh, and all of the application code that I'm showing will be available for download. Uh, I just have a couple buttons on the form and I start with the first one. And uh, I am going to use uh, Code Site Express to actually show some of this output. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to visualize and see and everyone who has XC7 certainly has Code Site Express so you can certainly follow along with that. But the first thing that we're going to do is um, with define our context and our type just like the sample code in the slide showed but now we're going to do something so in here for each type that we get we're going to now check if T is an RTTI string type so there's a whole slew of different methods uh, or types that are available to help us out uh, and we'll have a list of those hierarchies in just a minute but if it's a string type, then we're going to go ahead and send it out. So let me go ahead and run this real quick. And I'll just click the first button. And we have code site popping up here. And it gives me a list of all of the different types that it knows about that are all string related. And so we have, you know, string, which we would expect, but wide string and ANSI string and raw byte and even font name and T caption and these uh, properties here, or not properties, these classes are aliases of the string and they're used for registering property editors. And so if the file name has a different property editor to bring up a dialog box than the font name which displays a list of the fonts on the system. And so that's where you'll see multiple references showing up. We can then, uh, we could also filter this in a variety of ways if we wanted. In the next button, button number two, what I'm going to do here is uh, a little bit more complicated. I'm going to uh, call get type, not get types now. So I'm just taking a specific type and I'm passing it T button. So again, this is one of the variations I can call. So I'm giving it an actual class. So give me the type information on a T button. And that will be held in the T. Then I'm going to specify, I'm referencing a couple properties here. One, the qualified name and the base type name. From there, I'm getting for each property, a TRTTI property, that's inside of the declared properties for the T button, send those out to CodeSite. 
So let's see what the output looks like and then we can explain what's going on. So going back here, click my second button, bring back my viewer, and we'll go scroll back up to the top. So here we are showing the, the qualified name, which is the unit scope name plus the class. So it's VCL standard buttons T button or standard controls T button. And the base class of that is a T custom button. Now we have all of the declared properties. So action, you know, caption, cancel, all of these pieces that come in here, double buffer and so forth. So it gives us the list of all of the properties and the events. And remember that an event uh, is just a special kind of property. It's a method pointer property. And so uh, it's still defined as a property. So it's the same thing as a declared property. It's just its type is a little bit different. And uh, this quick way of accessing that and iterating through it allows us to extract that information. So now you can see where the object inspector would be doing something similar to get at that this information to find the list of properties that it needs to display in the grid. So I mentioned the object hierarchy. We saw several different um, types being used, uh, helpers. We had the RTTI type, of course the context as well. Uh, we also had the RTTI property. So as we iterated through, we got a bunch of references to those. Uh, you can see there's a whole list of these. We, if we're dealing with fields, we'll do the RTTI field uh, type. If we're doing methods and index properties, all of those uh, are referenced here. Uh, in addition, there's um, this notion of a simple type versus a structured type. And the simple types are pretty what you would expect. Uh, ordinals, so those are your integer values. Uh, floating points in 64s. Uh, methods are really just a simple type. Um, the set type, string types, of course. The structured types are the things that have additional information, multiple sections of data, things like that. So you've got uh, the record type and an interface type, uh, an array type, where we've got lots of different pieces and there's more that we can uh, query when we use, uh, we give references to these types. We use the word type quite a bit in this presentation. So next up is the RTTI object. And this gives us reference to uh, the particular name, the parent, uh, the package that's used, uh, the attributes. So this is if we were going to define a custom attribute for a particular uh, coding element, we would get that by using the get attributes function. RTTI type. Uh, this is the return value of the get types function, so we can iterate over those. Uh, here's where we already use the qualified name and the base type, but you can also get type kind. So if we wanted to find all of the uh, various types that um, are, say, integers for our class, we could go through each of the properties, get the properties type, kind and, and and do things like that. So you have a lot of flexibility for it. Uh, various methods on a type. This you have the fields, methods, properties, declared fields, declared methods, declared properties. And um, what you have defined at the class itself versus everything that gets inherited. And so uh, there's your distinction between the two. So in addition to properties, which we've been able to do for a while, we had that with classic RTTI, well now we can work with fields themselves, the backing stores, the instance fields of our particular types. We can, to get values, we can set values of those fields. We can uh, get information about the fields by get using uh, the RTTI instance type or the record type. Uh, so we can get these by calling get field, get fields, or declared fields. Uh, so a lot of different variations uh, for that. And we'll see some examples in a bit. Uh, continuing more, we've already seen that we can get the value for a given property, but there's more to it. We can also set the values on properties as well. Uh, query whether or not that property is writable. 
Uh, so on a read-only property, for example, you'd only be able to get the value is writable would be false. Um, again, we can get an instance type uh, by calling get property, get properties, or declared properties. And uh, an instance type, as it sounds, is a reference to uh, an instance, and we actually get real values out of that. T value is a very useful addition to the RTTI world. Um, in a lot of ways, you can consider it as a version of the variant type, a variant of the variant. Um, but it serves a little bit of a different role. Uh, its, its sole purpose is to actually help uh, get data and uh, and be able to kind of treat it differently if it if necessary uh, the key though is unlike a variant there's no data conversion that happens automatically um, so what simply that means is that whatever you put into a t-value that's what must come out of the t-value now there are helper functions available at the t value level that allow you to do some sort of conversions. Uh, if you saw my generics class, I actually did an example where I used that. But a regular variant will just automatically figure out how the value needs to be treated. That's not the same with a t value. And so uh, it's just a helpful little class you need to be aware of because it's, it's quite useful when we're dealing with the extended RTTI. So let's dig in a little bit deeper for all of this. Uh, we're going to uh, do a second uh, application, but here we're going to uh, record the various properties similar to what we just did, uh, but we're going to do it for any object, dynamically change that. We're also going to be able to update uh, various properties on a form. So we'll have a kind of our own little editor. So let's take a look at our code here. So I'm going to switch over to this form change my active project to the properties and what we've got is we're, we can pick a particular control so whether we're doing the button the checkbox or panel and these are the three controls whichever one we pick we can hit record properties and that will actually save all the published properties to a uh, uh, to our code site log uh, and then here we can decide what we for a given property we're going to get a list uh, or given component, list of properties, and then we're going to update their value uh, appropriately. And so let's take a look at the uh, what is how it works, then we'll see how the code makes it all happen. So let me go ahead and run this real quick. And uh, we have our little, we'll start with a button one. Well, let's see, we'll do it the checkbox and we'll record the properties. And if we look here, um, here we're not just giving you the property names, but their actual values. So for this particular, um, the object type is a checkbox. So it's the fully qualified name. And we have the various properties. So we know that the check state is false and uh, various what the caption is says checkbox one. Well, you know, let's change that. So let's find, and I'm getting the list of all the properties using RTTI for this. So let's change the caption for my checkbox. And we'll make this, um, Let's see, what is a good option here? Let's do, um, well, let's do something fun like uh, extra cheese for a, uh, a pizza delivery application. And if I go ahead and update that, then I've actually changed at runtime the property for that. I can also go in and find the checked property and change that to be true and I'll update that so that the check state is also listed there. So how do we make all this happen? So first off let's see what do we do to record the properties. So here it's uh, pretty straightforward. I'm getting uh, I have an object I'm trying to find the component and I'm finding the component simply based off of uh, what is the item that's in my group? So again, find component, simple standard function. I get the reference. I then call record properties with that object reference. So what does that look like? That's the real work. Well, given the object, I call, I have a context. So I've defined that. I call get type passing in the object's class information. 
So I still need to know I'm passing in types, not an instance of it. I can get the type info, the class information out of this from the instance, but I still that's what I need to pass to it. Now with the RTTI type, I can get a lot of data. So here I'm getting all the properties, everything that it knows about, but I only want the published ones. So here I'm checking that the visibility for that property is a published. If it is, then I write out the value uh, to the code site log. I send out the name of the property, which is the name property on the P, uh, to get the value, um, two things that I need. I need the type and I need the instance because the instance is what holds the current value. So the type I already know because my P is tied to the type I'm working with. However, I still need to pass it the object reference that I'm working with to actually get the right value. And so if you've ever done any of the classic RTTI, this is a dream to work with compared to the old way. Um, this is just very elegant. It's very clean. Uh, it's, it's very, very cool. Uh, so the next step is to do the update. So if we wanted to hit that update button, what we're checking here is to make sure that we actually have a property selected. Uh, we find uh, the control again, what object we want. Then we call this helper function called update property, given the object instance. So that's going to be the button, the checkbox, or the panel. And then what is the property name that we want to modify? That's coming from our combo box. And what is the new value that we want it to be? And we, we're typing it into an edit box. It's no different than the object inspector. The object inspector in our IDE is a glorified string grid. And so uh, it's not much difference there. So what does update property do? Uh, a little bit more complicated, but uh, actually not too bad at all. So given the object, the property name and value that we want to modify. So first thing, again, we need the type information for that particular object instance. So we call get uh, type off of our context. We then will get the particular uh, property information for the property name. Here we do have to check for nil because it's quite possible that we would specify a different name, a, a property name that is not defined on this type. So we check for nil. Uh, if it's not nil, then we can say, okay, for the P that it was returned, what is the property type and its kind? So here's where we start doing some extraction on, okay, am I dealing with integers versus an enumeration versus floats or some string value? And so here, I've, I haven't exhausted all of the variations of it, but I've done most of them. So for the various strings, I, get, I can set the value. Uh, same thing for an enum, same thing for uh, setting the floating point number and then certainly the prop value. And so even for like the Boolean typing in true, uh, this is where T value comes into play. So I typed in, uh, I'm getting the enum value based on what I called in here. So that's uh, the string. That gives me back a, an enum value, which then I can make into a value, which gets passed to um, the actual helper. So uh, set value is what's used to update the actual control. And so once I've updated this object instance, it immediately reflects that on the screen. And that's pretty much it. The rest of this is all just to support uh, populating the combo box with the various properties. So when I change the radio group, uh, I get the appropriate objects properties showing up in the combo box. It's pretty cool. So next up is RTTI method. Well, what's cool about this is that this allows us to call um, instance methods dynamically. Uh, we can kind of construct them, we can figure out if we can call them, we can build it up as we needed, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of different things that we can check. So, you know, is a particular method a constructor, is it a destructor, is it a class, is it a static, so forth. 
we can get the parameters, we can get uh, return types, and of course we can call invoke to actually execute the particular function. Uh, what's neat about the uh, invoke method is that there's several different uh, variations of that, overloaded, um, that allows us to determine or specify the instance that we're going to use. Now parameters that are uh, passed to the method, because again our methods can have you know multiple parameters, that is uh, accomplished by creating an array of t values. So there, there's that little helper again, t value. So we put a we you know we have a very uh, an array of those and that's what we're going to use as the argument list and then what gets returned back from us is another t value that will hold the result so let's uh, take a look at the RTTI methods code so here let me change up my example and we'll come back to here and this one is a little bit straightforward uh, it's using a typical uh, process that you might see, uh, certainly a good starter point to start invoking things. I, I've got a uh, little group box to select a control type, so a button, checkbox, and a panel. And I have simply create a control. So what is this going to do? Let's go in and take a look. First it checks to see if I have something selected in the group. Uh, if I do, I'm going to create a control type. Well, I'm just getting the name of the control type. So what is it that I want to create? I get that. Now I'm going to call create control. So what does create control do? Well, I'm actually going to dynamically call the constructor on this particular type that I'm just referencing by a name. So here, again, starting out with the context, I want to find the type associated with this name. Now the name does need to be fully qualified, which is why I had a fully qualified in the uh, the group box. So VCL, standard controls, T button, so forth. This will give me a reference to an instance type. So a real type that I have. Now from using T, I can call get method. Here I'm checking to see, okay, give me the information for the create and actually invoke it. So get me the create, invoke it. Now I know that this will be true. All three of those classes have constructors on them called create. So I don't, I, I'm, again, I'm being a little bit loose in my checking, but again, I know it's not going to fail. Then the invoke, I'm going to pass to it. Um, well, this is kind of interesting. What do you pass to the constructor? Well, we need to pass the um, and some of this you know we don't see this because the compiler takes care of it for us but we need to pass to it the type that gets created and a reference to the object itself um, well a reference to the object that's serving as the owner remember your constructor these are components so it has an, an owner to it and so that's why we're, uh, we specify the invoke. This is the meta class type. What do we want to create? It's T. So that's what we found. So that's what we want to create. And the owner for that is self. Well, self is referencing the form, which is exactly what we want. Then from there, from that same T, we're going to get the parent and set the parent to of our object so the control that we created as an object and then we want to set that to be the uh, panel workspace so again this is just I'm not using I don't care what type it is as long as I found a reference to it I'm building up the various functions as I go now I'm getting the property for the caption and I'm setting that to new whatever the value is doing the control split and then finally I'm setting the bounds uh, calling set bounds and passing it uh, this new X and Y position which I'm adjusting down in update position and setting the width and height for it so what does all of this do well based on what I pick if I pick the button I create a button if I create the checkbox, I create the checkbox, and it's positioning 
each of them in this list and it will word wrap them around I can keep going and it just positions them up all of this is these are clickable buttons they're real buttons and check boxes um, each one's a different instance and I'm just using RTTI methods to do all the construction for them so that's all the information that I have uh, regarding some the advanced RTTI. Uh, there is a whole lot more that you can dig deeper into it. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to go much beyond what I've covered. Um, but um, all, as I said before, the uh, all the source code examples are available at the URL listed there on the raise.com website under sessions advanced RTTI. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them for you during the live Q&A and just thank you uh for your time well i that was exciting that was, i have uh that my mind's blown <laughs> <laughs> great stuff um there's a few questions that come in here is there some literature on marshalling um I'm not sure if that's related to this or not versus php on linux servers and i use a tool in jedi jvcl for serializing and using html xml like structures i don't think that's Related to RTTI, uh, is it possible to achieve? Well, you can use you, you can use RTTI for doing some marshalling okay. you know, to handle that in a generic manner. Um, but that particular question, I, I really don't have anything to add on that. You can use RTTI. All right, thank you. Is it possible to retrieve RTTI for strict private members? For strict private, um, ooh, that's a good question. Uh, if we can follow up with an email, if the, whoever asked that wants to ask, I can dig that into that. I don't know if it goes down to the strict level. Certainly, the private level you can get to. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't know off the top of my head if the strict one. I've actually haven't needed to try to get to those. Okay. Using RTTI to access private fields directly would violate proper OO design. It would do better. Oh, absolutely. To... <laughs> it's one of those things. Just because you can doesn't mean it's a good idea. Uh, Correct. It would be better to have only the public fields properties and methods being exposed emitted by default. Okay. Uh, which, I... which is what I believe they are. If you look, well, the fields themselves, it kind of covers all of them, but then the uh, you can control that at your level for the classes and things that you want to support. So there's that, that RTTI directive that gives you a lot of control over the filtering of how you want the RTTI generated for your classes. So if you really wanted to only make the public and published properties and fields visible uh, for inspection, you could certainly do that. All right, my typing's gone downhill. I apologize. Can I use advanced RTTI with any of my existing classes, like a serializer for my class? I would think so. I don't think there's anything that would preclude it. Uh, it kind of depends on what how your serializer is working and what it's expecting to get. But uh, if you've got an interface where you're taking an object and you want to serialize it into some format, part of that process is to inspect the members of what you're serializing and certainly you can use the new uh, RTDI functions to do that. Okay. Is it possible to get class helper functions with RTTI? You've compiled it, you're accessing. Yeah, I would it's probably showing up. I just don't know if the if the filtering how that gets impacted with the class helpers. You know, what does the compiler actually generate for that? Um, I could see you getting some interesting effect where if your class helper changed some of the filtering for the generation of the RTTI compared with the, the main class that it's helping, would that cause some sort of problems or disconnect? Sounds like a fun experiment to try. <laughs> yep. An example of RTTI would work nice if you spell create correctly, but perhaps you should have some try-catch to catch misspelled method names. 
Is there? Oh, sure. I, in, in the example, I yeah. suppose if, if I misspell the method name, would there be a problem? Absolutely. That there. Yes, that's. I think that's what the intent is. I, and I think you. There's a lot more. If you're doing something production ready, where you're trying to do that dynamically, more like a scripting type language, then yeah, you'd want to have a lot more protection over that. Yeah, I think you alluded to the fact that you, you didn't have any checks in there because you were assuming that there was a create method and that it had a constructor. Yep. Is there a way to add a field to an object? If not, is there a way to simulate adding a field to an object? Well, not in not that I'm aware of in the RTTI classes themselves. What it sounds similar to is, um, yeah, to adding a field or simulate it. It kind of, I'm, when I say when I hear field, I think of instance field, and I don't think that's going to really go well. You could simulate it with some like having an interface that would have a uh, some properties or uh, methods, getters and setters that would mimic what a field would do. Uh, you might possibly be able to accomplish that with. Um, like an aggregate, but I don't know what they're trying to solve by needing to add a field. Okay. What is the immediate use of RTTI if I have ac have the source code and can access all controls and data structures in code? Well, uh, so a couple things that come into mind where the RTTI is still valid is one, if you're dealing with attributes, which I really didn't dig into in this session, I didn't have the time. Um, so even though you would have all the code and everything, you'd still want to be able to inspect whether a particular method or property has any attributes associated with it. And RTTI is the way to get that. Um, if you have to do any kind of uh, marshalling and things, uh, you can do that in a generic way that would handle all of your objects rather than have to do custom ones for each of the classes that you have. So yeah, there's still some uses for it. Yeah. For logging, code site makes extensive use of RTGI. Uh, is there support for class records as well, or just, or I'm sorry, is there support for records as well, or just classes? No, I believe the records have RTTI with them as well. That, uh, but that may be added in a newer, I don't remember exactly when that was added. That may not have been in the original 2010 version. Do you know any way to get property name for? For example, to call get property function to avoid writing property from hand and have control for get property arguments in compile time. I mean about something like t control dot parent dot prop name or t control dot caption. I'm still I, 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 I'm reading the question. I'm still not quite sure what it is that they're trying to solve. Because you, you can still have to whether uh, you can check with some of the tip info functions whether or not a given property exists on an object that you pass. So I, I'm not quite sure if the, the person asking the question is wanting to determine if a property exists and get to it or if they want to find all the properties that are on a given object. I think both can be done, but I may be missing something of what they're trying to solve. There's a few quest requests for some of the other um, set download sessions, downloads from your other sessions earlier this week. Or earlier oh, down. sure. So if you could uh, put those in the chat log or just tell me what they are, I could type them in here real quick. No, I'll, I'll go back in and type them into the response. Okay, great. I've used RTTI to design a flexible security system for applications, give administrators the ability to hide menu items, buttons, controls. Very useful through that. Yes, I've done that too, Brian. That is. Yeah, very cool. <clears throat> Very cool stuff. I did. A, yeah, I had one that would uh, stream all the change properties in the database and reapply them all through RTTI. It's very good. So essentially, would it be possible to create or add properties on the fly to classes or records based on scripts? Uh, not in the. I don't think in the traditional sense to do that. I mean, I suppose you could probably create a, a system that would allow you to do that or to simulate that ability. Um, 
with uh, similar to what .NET does with some of its uh, designer support, where you can create an interface and have it uh, like an I extendable. And then in there, you can define some pairs and it looks like a uh, that you've added a property to an object, but it's really, you have to manage the data store separate for it. It's really just a, a simulation of what it looks like, but not uh, unless you wanted to drill down into the, to the, the VMT and start tweaking low level bit stuff, that's probably your best bet. Okay. There's always a way to do things, but how much how much trouble it is is the other question. Right. Um let's see. D -d -d -d. I think a uh, field RTTI for records was in 2010 for record methods came in like XE2 or later according to Stefan Glinky. Uh, RTTI for record properties unfortunately is still missing as far as I Okay, well, if there's any other questions for Ray, go ahead and type them in now. Otherwise, as I mentioned earlier, we do need to restart uh, GoToWebinar uh, in order to free up some seats because we're running out of seats. It's been a busy day. Uh, Jim's asking, dynamic runtime properties are very difficult to create. I've done it. It's awesome, but I had to mimic the entire property system and modify the instance size method. Sure. Yep. <clears throat> Dean's asking if you have any examples where RTTI was the go-to method where no other prop methods existed to obtain the functionality that was wanted. I'm failing to see the usefulness of RTTI. Uh, well, I don't have any examples to share, but in production code, um, actually there's a big system that I work with um, for Disney that uh, we use the RTTI to do all of our message transport. And uh, it makes it really nice to be able to take any object, any message that we want to pass around and uh, create our transport packet from that. And the only way we've worked, you know, to do that effectively is using our TTI. So in practice, there's some really good uses for it. Uh, not to mention that and you, people probably don't realize this, but our TTI is used every time you open up Delphi and design in a FireMonkey form or a VCL form or any of that, because the whole component streaming mechanism is all relying on RTTI. Yep, that's true. The object inspector and all of that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, even if it's not something you're gonna use in your code, it's definitely something that you should care about because it is, like you said, being used in Delphi every day. As far as the, the utility of RTTI, it really comes down to uh, what you're trying to do. There are a lot of co pro codes you'll write that you'll never need RTTI, especially the, even the advanced RTTI. But there will be possibly instances where you'll be like, oh, if only I could uh, access my objects like data, that's what RTTI lets you do. It lets you get in there and say, oh, inspect this object, inspect the component, especially like uh, your components and stuff like that, and go in and find out information about them. Or like creating... Uh, systems for letting users change their user interface and stuff like that based on different properties. Well, thank you, Ray, for yet again another fabulous session. You're welcome. Lots of good information here. I was, I'm was i excited. This is some cool stuff. Um, I hadn't gotten into that deep into some of this stuff yet, so looks like a great, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, something great to take advantage of. All right, so... I, is this is it? We're done with. Are you done now? Finally, uh, I am done. This was number six of six. Six so. of six. Well, thank you so much for all that you do, Ray. And uh, it's been a great, a, a great uh, code rage so far. And I appreciate all that your contributions with that. Uh, I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. I'm uh, glad uh, we had a good turnout. And uh, I'll fill in some of those link questions in the next couple minutes. And uh, again, if anybody has any other questions, they can certainly contact me via email.